Hello, my sweet babies, and welcome back to Reading with Miss Anthony, installment one, but this is part three. Let me encourage you to watch parts one and two if you have not already done so, because we're going to jump straight into part three. Let's do a quick recap first, though. Our book is entitled January Sparrow. From the beginning, January and Sadie are our main characters. Um, the story is taking place in the slavery slash sharecropping era. January runs from the plantation, um, ends up getting caught, has to come back after being severely beaten. And um, the Crosswhites had to watch. The youngest of the Crosswhites, her name was Sadie. And she really had a strong love for her brother, January. Now the Crosswhites have gotten to freedom. And there are some strangers in Marshall, Michigan. That's where we're going to pick up, guys. Let's get a chance to meet these strangers in Marshall, Michigan. If you have not tuned in, it's time. All right. January Sparrow by Patricia Polacco, part three. Guys. Remember, I will put the, the picture to the screen and then I will pull it back and I will read for you guys. All right. Here's where we're starting, guys. For the next two weeks, folks in Marshall was watchful. But no one came into town that was known to them. So folks started feeling easier. It was four o'clock in the morning, January 27th, 1847, when Adam Crosswhite was jarred awake by a fierce pounding at his front door. Boom, boom, boom. Thinking that it might be Mr. Gorham, he opened the door. Three men pushed past the door so hard that it almost wrenched clean off his hinges. It was Francis Troutman, Willie Ford, and Jimmy Lee. Lee seized Adam and tried to force him out of the front door into a waiting wagon. David Giltner, the master's son, was driving, but Adam broke free and raced upstairs, shouting for his family to hide. The three was right behind him, but he barricaded his bedroom door, threw open his window, and fired a single shot into the air. They here, Adam yelled. They here to take us away. He hoped auction bell had heard. Adam could see lights in the windows up his street, just as three men broke down his door and seized him. As they dragged him down the stairs, Adam could hear auction bell ring down the streets, already hollering for help. Sadie and her brothers had hidden in the attic eaves. But one by one, Lee and Ford reached in and grabbed them out. Sadie started praying. Dear God, turn me into a sparrow and let me fly far, far away from here. Dear God, turn me into a sparrow and let me fly far, far away from here. She chanted. Then she felt a hand grab her by the hair and drag her down the stairs. Her back bumping each step and bruising all the way down. Lee and Ford flung all the cross whites in a heap on the kitchen floor, then tried to force them all on their feet and out the door into the waiting room. It's freezing out there. My children need coats and boots, Sarah pleaded. She pulled her children around her. Then her eyes fell on David Giltner. He was just standing there in the kitchen. David, you, she whispered. He hardened his gaze and didn't look away. I am here representing the interests of my father, and we are within our rights to take you all back to Kentucky, he bawled. Sarah came close to his face. My milk made your bones, boy. She whispered through clenched teeth. I held you at my chest and raised you up as my very own. And now you're going to do me like this? Tears filled her eyes. Do you think your dad is finally going to love you for doing this? She hissed. David Giltner looked away and went out to the wagon.
auction bell kept a ringing. A crowd started gathering outside of the Cross White House. People, both white and colored, started screaming down the street with sticks, hammers, torches, and clubs. They was round up and shouting and shaking their fists. Some of the men even dropped their coats in their bitter cold and were fixing the fight. You ain't taking those cross whites anywhere, they yelled. They surged forward, shook their fists, and pounded on the outside of the cross white house. They was coming from every direction. Even Lee and Ford looked scared. That's when Francis Chapman went outside, drew his revolver, and pointed it at the crowd. Stand back! Stand back, I say! He ordered as he spun around, pointing the gun at them. The crowd pulled back. The deputy sheriff pushed his way from the back of the crowd and stood with Troutman, glowering at the crowd. These here men, he announced over at the den of the mob, have the right under the law to reclaim their property. The crowd roared. Property? People ain't nobody's property, a voice called out. The deputy tried to shout over the protests. These here blacks are the guildness properties. It's the law. Now all of you stand down, he barked. Troutman hoisted up his gun and crossed his arms defiantly outside the front door. In the house, Jimmy Lee lurched at Sarah Crosswhite and latched baby Francis by her ankle. We're taking them. None of you can stop us. It's the law, Lee growled. Sarah screamed and fell back, still holding her baby. Lee pulled at both of them as Sarah skidded on the floorboards with her heels. Suddenly, the crowd parted and Goreham and Ingersoll came bursting through into the house. They wrestled the baby away from Lee. This child was born in a free state. She is a freeborn citizen of Marshall and you cannot take her, Gorham shouted. He and Ingersoll forced the Kentucky Four out of the Cross White's kitchen and shoved them out the front door. Then Gorham and Ingersoll stood with their backs to the door. The Cross Whites were safe inside. Gorham leaned into Francis Troutman's face like I said, you ain't taking these people anywhere. The crowd surrounded the four and leaned towards them, crowding in. Francis Troutman straightened his coat and tried to catch his composure. I want all of your names. He took a pad from his pocket. And I am taking these here names to your magistrate, demanding that he order your arrest. Because you all are breaking the law, he thundered over the grumbling crowd. The crowd suddenly grew quiet for a long moment. Then a black man stepped forward. I is Plantamorse, he said. I'm James Smith, another said. I'm C.W. Hackett, still another said. And I am Charles Berger. I'm Willie Parker. One after another stepped up and wagged their heads, marking, mocking Troutman. Then Ingersoll, Heard, Easterly, and even Dr. Comstock, all white men gave their names. And I am Charles Goreham, spelled G-O-R-H-A-M. Be sure you put it in the capital letters now, Goreham said triumphantly. The crowd roared its approval and started to push at each of the Kentucky men. They jostled them about like bouncing balls, laughing when one lost his balance and failed. Even the deputy was full of fear. He drew his gun and fired into the air. The crowd pulled back. He turned full circle, aiming his gun at everybody. The fact remains, 
he said breathlessly. The thieves here cross whites are fugitive slaves. He whirled around as the crowd would. Under the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793, these men have the legal right to take back these here slaves. He turned around to their rightful owner. The crowd roared at him. He lifted his gun at them again. Their rightful owner, Mr. Francis Gildner, the deputy shouted. The crowd seemed to pull back. What if and he's right? A voice cried out. Then the crowd just stood there. No one seemed to know what to do next. Then a lone voice called from among them. If you let these men take this family back to Kentucky, they'll be whipped and tortured and left for dead like I was. A young black stepped forward and stood in the front of the cross white's door facing the crowd. This here is what had happened to him. He said as he removed his overcoat and then his shirt, and the bitter cold steam rose up off his scarred skin. He put out his arms and slowly turned his back to the crowd. All that stood there was stunned to silence. You! Ford hissed as he stared at the young man. Boy, you should be dead. We should have lynched you, Lee grumbled as he spat at the young man's feet. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. I think it's January. Sweet January. January, January, I knew you was alive, Sadie called out as soon as she saw his face. She took his hand and poured him into the kitchen while all of the cross whites wept and hugged him. You've come to us, praise God. You've come home to us, Adam cried as he held January's face in his hand. Outside the front door, the crowd was louder and angrier than ever. January gave them the reason to press into the Kentucky Ford like a Michigan tornado. They pushed at them, tugged at them, and yelled at them. When Mr. Gorham put up his hand, the crowd listened. This is a matter for Judge Hobart, he said. Judge Hobart, Judge Hobart. The crowd war roared, and they pressed the Kentucky Four right up off their feet. Then they herded them down the street like cattle, right down to the courthouse. All of the crosswives shed tears of happiness, even knowing their life here in Marshall was over now that Giltner knew where they was. I wasn't safe either. Now that they knew I, January, was still alive, we all would have to set out for Canada. Within the hour, we had almost finished packing what we could when Mr. Ingersoll arrived at the wagon to take us to Jackson to catch the train headed for Detroit. We came all out of breath and covered with snow, but he was smiling so broadly, everyone wondered why. Judge Hobart just jailed Lee, Ford, Gildner, and Troutman for attempting to kidnap you and for assault, he said, laughing and slapping his knee. Adam and Sarah looked at each other puzzled. His clerk said to tell you all that he's going to hold them there in jail for the next two days. That should give you guys enough time to get to Canada before they can catch up with you. In your soul, trumpeted. I love the language in this book. Sadie smiled to herself. She knew exactly why Judge Hobart kept them there. Polly. Polly must have told her father the secret. Thank you, Polly. Sadie whispered to herself and then smiled. But tears filled her eyes. There will be no time to say goodbye, Polly. To Polly, her best friend.
I guess some secrets is meant to be kept and some ain't. Now, I said at this at the beginning that this here was Sadie's story, but I guess it's just as much mine too. That day back in Kentucky, when I was beat so bad and left staked out for dead, that night, Adam came for me. He carried me himself to the woods and hid me with that ass quill. Oh, he dug my grave all right, but he put nothing but field rocks in it. He marked it so the master and the patty rollers would never look for me again. When the cross whites left, that is, brought me Sadie Sparrow. He knew how much she had loved it, and he knew that one day I'd find her and give it back to her. So I carried that sparrow for four years, all the way hoping to find the only family I ever know. I guess I repaid Adam Cross to White for saving my sorry life by being there early that morning when the Patty Rollers was trying to take him and his family back to Kentucky. Now we's a family again. We left Marshall knowing there was talk of freeing the slaves and even talk of the war with the South. So even though we was all sad to leave, we was full of hope too. After we was gone, Francis Troutman did not come back to Marshall, or did come back to Marshall, and took all of the men that gave up their names to court. Because of the Slave Act, they was forced to pay. But in 1860, Abraham Lincoln was elected president, and in the middle of the war between the North and the South, the Civil War, he gave all slaves their freedom. Now, I know all the history books will say that war was war was started with the first shot fired at Fort Sumter. But for us and all of the citizens of Marshall, Michigan, the real first shot was fired that morning in January 1847 by Adam Crosswhite. Leastwise, that's what we believe. After the Civil War, the Crosswhites returned to Marshall. They lived out their lives both there and in nearby Battle Creek in freedom and peace. Sadie remained a lifelong friend of Polly Hobart, Chancellor, and continued to be a devoted sister to her beloved January Drummond. Upon January's death and shortly before her own, Sadie Cross White Crosby held her most prized possession bundled in a faded piece of worn calico. Inside was a small carved sparrow. She took it to her fireplace and committed it to the flames. Then she spoke these last words to her only son. It's fixing the fly, and so is I. We are done, guys. Installment one, reading with Miss Anthony. Once again, this is January Sparrow. Here are just some, some questions for you to think about and possibly do some written, either written discussion or just discussion within your household during this extended break. What are the conflicts inside of this story? And then what are the ways they resolve the conflict, conflict resolution? And maybe our skill this week on I Ready was recounting or retelling a story. Let's see if you cannot recount the beginning, the middle, and the end of January Sparrow. If you have not gone back to watch part one and part two of Reading with Miss Anthony, installment one, please do. Once again, this is an AR novel. It is level 4.0 and it is worth one AR point, guys. I will pick up a new book next week. I can't wait to read with you guys next week. 
I really enjoyed this week. Once again, practice retelling the story, beginning, middle, and end. And your discussion question, what are the conflicts or problems inside of the story? And how do the characters resolve the conflicts? There are multiple conflicts. How do the characters resolve the conflicts that are listed in this novel? Once again, this is January Sparrow by Patricia Polacco, read by Mrs. Anthony. Thank you, guys. And I hope to see you next week. Bye-bye.